Today, we bring you one of the main courses, the Creepypasta Zero. We recommend you to get comfortable and turn off the lights to enjoy the experience. Let's start! Alice was a young girl with green eyes and candy-colored hair. She was sweet and intelligent, but very shy and never had any friends. That's why she often created her own. Imaginary friends that she named with a number to differentiate them. There was one in particular that stood out, her first imaginary friend, Zero. For Alice, life was sad until Zero arrived. She was her best friend and always protected her. Zero wore a black sweater, black and white striped gloves and socks, and brown boots. Around her eyes were black circles. Alice would spend all her time with her, and when her parents saw her playing and talking to herself, they got worried and thought about seeking help. One summer day, Alice sat down to sunbathe in her garden. The sun caressed her pale skin. As she sat on the grass, she felt a strange sensation. Something in the depths of her mind urged her to cross to the other side of the street. Barefoot, she headed towards the road. As she looked up, she saw a large white truck coming towards her and she was paralyzed, in shock. There was a loud, squeaking sound as the vehicle turned in another direction, dodging her and falling down the hill until it caught fire. Alice froze pale. She watched as someone crawled desperately out of the vehicle, covered in crimson blood. It was her father, and next to him was her mother, screaming as they burned to death. Mom! Dad! She cried out. It was the last time she saw them. After the accident, she was adopted by her neighbor, Mrs. Rogers. She was an alcohol addict. Alice hated her very much, but she had no one else, no family, no friends. As she grew older, she forgot her imaginary friends. One day in class, Alice was absorbed drawing in her notebook when the teacher caught her attention. Alice, I suggest you pay attention in my classes. I don't think you need another zero. She was confused. Something the teacher had just said bothered her, but she didn't know what. She felt sick, so she asked for permission to go to the bathroom and rushed out. When she arrived, she washed her face with cold water and when she looked up to her reflection, she panicked. She swore she saw someone else. She went back to class and saw how strange red circles were drawn in her notebook. A chill ran through her body. As she left class, she found her only friend, Anne, who had short blonde hair and brown eyes. Hello, Alice. Welcome to Wonderland, said Anne. I'm not in the mood today, Anne, she replied seriously. Come on, cheer up. You have me here for anything. When she arrived home, she went up to her room trying not to make any noise. As she passed through the living room, she held her breath. Here you are, bloody girl, shouted Mrs. Rogers, grabbing her arm. Her breath stunk. Alice screamed. What is this, huh? She said, pushing her towards the kitchen where it was all full of beer cans and boxes of pre-cooked food. I... I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't have time to clean up. I was late for school. I don't need excuses. Don't let it happen again or you'll regret it, I swear. She threw her on the floor and she hit her head with the floor tiles. Alice picked everything up containing her sadness, anger, and confusion. The next day, she took another route to school so no one would see her. She walked through the snowy forest in her black sweatshirt covering the bruise on her face. Just as she got to school, something made her fall. She felt a group of boys laughing at her, her blood <laughs> boiling with rage more and more intensely. She got up and pushed the boy. She threw him to the ground and started hitting his face non-stop. Alice, stop! She heard screaming. What's wrong with you? We only want to help you. She looked up and saw everyone's horrified expression, including that of her friend Anne. She looked at her bloody knuckles and the boy's smashed face. What have I done? I didn't mean to, she thought. Tears filled her eyes. 
she stood up and fled into the woods. When she got home, she blindfolded her wounds in the bathroom and saw her reflection in the mirror. What did I just do? I didn't want to. Oh no, of course not. It was me. I just wanted to protect you, answered a voice using her own mouth. Alice stepped away surprised. It was unbelievable, but her reflection had just spoken for her. Who, who are you? She asked, stuttering. I'm your best friend, remember? Her head started spinning as she fell to the ground feebly. The voice was inside her head, repeating the same phrase over and over again. I'm your best friend, your only friend, Zero. In the following weeks, the voices stopped, but Alice began to become a different person, more and more irritable and violent. She often suffered sudden attacks and laughed like a mad woman. She felt as if her mind was someone else's. When Mrs. Rogers found out that she had been expelled from school, she got angry and locked her in her room. She sobbed, felt weaker and weaker, until one night she fainted. When she woke up, she was on the floor, her whole body hurt. There was no sign of Mrs. Rogers. Relieved, she left her room and went to the living room. She was surprised by news that appeared on television where they said they had found a decapitated woman. She decided to make herself a soup for dinner. A rotten smell struck her. A hammer covered with blood was lying on the floor. Scared, she returned to her room. As she entered, she saw the walls covered with circles drawn in blood. And on her bed laid Mrs. Rogers' lifeless head. She ran out of the room in horror, but tripped and fell down the stairs until she reached the floor unconscious. She woke up again in a room full of mirrors that reflected her pale face with tired eyes. Aren't you happy? It's gone. She won't bother you anymore, said the same spooky voice. She turned around, but no one else was there. What are you? A demon? I want answers. Don't you remember me, Alice? I'm your best friend. I'm Zero. We're best friends forever. I had to find a way to protect you. I'm part of your conscience, so I'm you. Whispered voice. That's not possible. I had to kill your parents. They wanted to separate us, but you still abandoned me. Now I'm getting stronger. Said the sinister voice. An uncontrollable rage seized Alice. With her fists, she punched the mirrors. She didn't feel any pain. She didn't feel anything at all. You took everything from me. I have no one because of you. She broke the last mirror and closed her eyes, blinded by a white glow. When she opened them again, she went to the bathroom to look at herself. Both her skin and her hair were completely white. Black circles surrounded her eyes. She began to laugh out loud. Alice was gone and Zero was free. I almost look like a skeleton, only missing the teeth, said Zira. She grabbed sharp scissors and cut out her cheeks in a grin from ear to ear. Blood flowed from the woods. She took a needle and sewed the flesh. Zero hated the red color, so she stuck her index finger in bleach and pointed at her eyes. When she regained her vision, all the colors had been dyed faded gray dark black and blind in white. The telephone rang and Zero answered imitating Alice's voice. It was Anne who invited her to her house because she had a gift for her. She picked up her hammer and went out the door impatiently with a psychopathic smile on her face. When Anne opened the door for her, she was shocked. Alice was now a white monster. Scared, she tried to run, but Zero grabbed her arm and threw her to the ground. Alice, what are you doing? shouted Anne in despair. Alice is not coming back. She was a pipsqueak. She laughed out loud. She lifted the heavy hammer and smushed it against her head. With the knife, she tore the skin to remove the bones. One by one, she deposited them on the ground next to the corpse, shaping a skeleton. 
Only the skull was missing, but it was shattered, so she plunged her hand into the pool of blood and painted a circle where the head should be. Next to the body was a box with a label that read, For Alice. She removed the cover, took the black and white stripped scarf from inside and wore it. Wow, thank you, Anne. That was fun. Now that you're gone, we will finally be zero. Said the martyr as she walked out the door and stepped into the darkness of the forest. Natalie Lett was a sweet and calm girl. She had hazel eyes with some green highlights. Her long, dark brown hair contrasts with her pale skin. She loved to paint, and when she ran out of sheets, she used the walls as a canvas. Her parents didn't like that. They often argued and punished her by locking her in the room. Plus, her older brother Lucas would mess with her all the time and make her life impossible at home. Natalie soon began to feel lonely and sad. As she grew older, she became a dark person, and her drawings became terrifying and bloody. One day in high school, she fell asleep while working on an English assignment, and the teacher called her attention. The teacher demanded that she gave her what she had done, but on top of Natalie's desk, there were only drawings of sinister characters and gruesome scenes. Time's up, Miss Ouellette. That phrase caught her attention. It seemed that time was always against her, and that bothered her. After class, she met Chris, her boyfriend. He had blonde hair and brown eyes. Natalie was glad to see him, but he was very serious. When she moved to kiss him, Chris turned his face away and said he wanted to break up with her. It's better if we give each other some time and space apart. Again with the time, thought Natalie. Why? What happened? It's your way of thinking, your drawings, you're always sad and you never smile. Natalie was shocked. Chris had broken her heart and she felt like her life was going from bad to worse. When she got home, she went to the bathroom to cry. <laughs> On the shelf, she saw her mother's sewing kit, fumbled until she found a needle and thread and looked at herself in the mirror. So, I never smile. She began to sew her cheeks in the form of a smile with a black thread. She felt excruciating pain, but all she did was laugh hysterically. <laughs> She was in a kind of trance. Blood dripped down the drain. And suddenly, her mother came into the bathroom and shouted. <coughs> they went to the hospital and Natalie explained to the doctor that her biggest problem was time. The time passed slowly, controlling society and torturing her to the end. She felt like a different person. She spent the night in the hospital. She woke up from a nightmare where a voice kept telling her that her time had run out. That her time was up. She tried to move, but she couldn't. She was handcuffed to the bed. A group of men with strange masks were with her in the room. One of them had a scalpel in his hand and told her that he would do a small surgery to keep her mind under control. She felt them giving her multiple injections of a viscous liquid that burned inside her skin. Her heart was beating intensely and it seemed like her head was going to explode. She closed her eyes and when she opened them again, everything had disappeared. Only the doctor was there, injecting her a sedative and asking her to calm down. She got rid of her ties, hit the doctor and tied him to the bed face down. She felt that something inside her was changing, something sinister like her paintings. She moved the mechanism to fold the bed completely and split his body in half. The doctor kept screaming inconsolably as he bled from his mouth. She painted the walls using blood and laughed out loud contemplating her art. She went to the bathroom and looked in the mirror, still holding the stitches on her face, forming the sinister smile. But now her eyes were completely green. She loved her new self. She fled the hospital and went to her house. She went into the kitchen and grabbed two knives. Her mother appeared and when she saw her, she screamed in horror. She tried to run down the hall but stumbled and fell to the ground. Natalie stabbed her several times while whispering, Sweet dreams, mother. Your time is up. Then she went in search of her father and her brother Lucas and martyred them, torturing them. When she finished, she went to her room. Everything was silent and she heard the ticking of a pocket watch on her bedside table. She remained listening to the sound for what was an eternity to her. She went to the bathroom and put the clock on one of her eyes, piercing the skin and tearing the organ until the device fit perfectly as her eye. 
Natalie was gone. Now she was clockwork. She burned down the house with the corpses of her family inside and moved away from the flames, plunging into the depths of the forest. Some say she's still alive. Determined to make your time end and avoid the agony of waiting, the only way to know if she's there watching you is to sleep near the window. In the dark of the night, you will be able to differentiate the chilling ticking sound and you will see the green flash of her eye. If she's there, you'll know your time is up. Today is an important day for the Clark family. After nine months, Mrs. Clark is finally going to give birth to her daughter. Everyone knows Mr. Clark. He's the most famous judge in the region. After a few hours, the nurse who is delivering the baby comes out to the waiting room and talks to Mr. Clark. Um, Mr. Clark? Yes, what's happening? Uh, you may have to see for yourself. What is happening? Well, your daughter seems to be a bit... The nurse begins to explain, taking slow steps back with notable fear towards the man in front of her. Special, she finally says. Mr. Clark began to run towards the room where his wife was. The newborn is a girl with blonde hair like the sun. Mrs. Clark had red hair, while Mr. Clark's was brown. The most surprising thing is that the baby had a pair of terrifying eyes. Her eyes were completely black, with a small singular shine. What is wrong with this girl? Mr. Clark yelled furiously at his wife. Are you sure she's mine? I'm going to request a DNA test. When the results came out, it was confirmed that she was his daughter. The girl grew normally. Her eyes were completely dark, but they didn't show any vision problem. On the contrary, her eyesight seemed better than that of a normal person. Mr. Clark doesn't understand what was happening with his daughter. He always dreamed of the perfect girl. He wasn't willing for anyone to see that monster. He selfishly decided to raise her at home. Mrs. Clark, who depended on the judge for everything, had no choice but to accept. Years later, Dina Angela, the girl with extraordinary eyes, has just turned 13. She's a shy and quiet young lady who doesn't know how to relate. Dina knows that her father is a very famous judge and the fairest. He always looks for perfection in everything, and Dina is not. With her mother, however, everything was different. Dina is mom's spoiled girl. She hardly goes outside the precinct of the family mansion. She has short, messy blonde hair, but her mother always brushes it when her father's around. Contrary to him, Dina loves her eyes. They fascinate her. She doesn't have any friends. She used to dream that she was playing with the children in the park that she could see from her room in the distance. Someone knocks on the door. It's mom. Dina, I'm going to the mall. Do you want me to get something for you? No, thanks. But daughter, you haven't been eating anything and you seem so sad. I'm going to bring you something special. Her mother was always spoiling her behind the scenes of her father. Dina really wants to try everything on the outside, but she knows she can't. The perfect Mr. Clark wouldn't let people know that his daughter is a monster. Maisha, her twisted nanny who accompanies her since she was born, watches over her at all hours, every step, every sigh. Dina loves visiting her father's library. Although he doesn't like it, she always manages to slip away to enter. The pure white-colored sword placed in a glass case in the middle of the room is her favorite item. Dina can stand for hours looking at it. According to his mother, there was a legend that the sword originally belonged to a righteous angel, and during a war the sword accidentally fell into the human world and was never found by the angel again. However, since then, different humans in the world began to use it. It is believed that only destined people can handle it. Dina touches the glass case and could almost feel as if she was holding the sword. Suddenly she heard footsteps approaching. She hid. The door opens. It's Maisha. She was looking for her. Her mother has just returned loaded with bags. Mr. Clark meets her at the front door. What did you buy? He grabs Mrs. Clark's arm when he asks, her bags falling to the floor in shock. Is this for her? I've told you a thousand times to stop pampering her. Mr. Clark swings his wife's arm. She's very nervous and almost falls. Dina runs to help her mother. Enough! Mr. Clark releases her and leaves. Mom, are you okay? Don't worry, I'm fine. I'm very clumsy today. The truth is that Mrs. Clark can't leave her husband. She loves Dina too much, and she would lose custody if they divorced. Dina walks her mother into the room and lies down on her lap. Mom, do you hate me? My eyes. Of course not. You're my angel after all. Angel. 
Dina suddenly remembers the sword in the collection room. Mom, do you want to escape? Her mother nods. Let's run away together. They prepare the plan to escape a week later on Christmas Eve. Dina has prepared everything. They just have to wait until nightfall to run away. She's sitting in her room looking out the window. Suddenly, someone knocks on the door. It's Mrs. Clark. Run, Dina. Your father knows. Before Dina can react, Mr. Clark pushes Mrs. Clark away and walks in. Damn monster, I'm gonna kill you. They've discovered you. The journalists keep calling. You've let yourself be seen, monster. Mr. Clark throws her aside. Her mother tries to save her. Dina hits her head and passes out. When Dina regains consciousness, she finds herself locked in the basement in a kind of cage. Misha walks in. Hey little monster, how does it feel to be there? I knew about your plans to escape, and that's why I sent your photos to the reporters. I hate you since you were born, and your father forced me to watch you in order to avoid being put in jail. I'm sick of this life. Dina was too angry. She felt as if something new came out of her. She grabs Misha's ankle, knocks her off her feet, and drags her with force. Misha yells. Dina stares at the woman. What you have done cannot escape the eyes of an angel, so now I will announce that you are. Dina chokes Misha even harder and whispers in the woman's ear. Guilty. Dina laughs hysterically, not believing what she just did, grabs the keys from the deceased Misha's pocket to open the cage, and heads upstairs to the library. She walks over to the crystal box, knocks it over and picks up the glowing sword from the ground. Dina goes to Mr. Clark's office. The time has come. Her father isn't inside, but there's her mother. She looks very bruised. Dina walks over to her mother and holds her. Her mother is no longer breathing. She wipes away her tears and leaves the room in search of her father. Dad, Daddy, Daddy, where are you? Mr. Clark is in the kitchen covering his injuries with an ice pack. What are you doing here? How did you escape? He's getting more and more nervous. Monster. You're a monster. You shouldn't have been born. Stay away from me. How dare you defy an angel, father? Now I will announce that you are guilty. Dina stabs her father with her sword, ending his life. She no longer has anything left in that house. As she had planned, she runs away never to return. The era of the righteous angel has just begun, so be careful what you do. You never know when you might become guilty. It all started with another family camping trip. My brother Andy, my parents, my aunt Laura, my uncle Ben and I always planned an annual camping adventure in the nearby mountains. Every year we liked to go a little higher and a little further. We arrived and pitched our tent on a grassy plain. It was quite nice and quiet. It seemed unbelievable that we were only a few miles from city life. The only part I don't like about these trips is that there's no bathroom, so if you needed some quiet you have to bring a shovel and hope you don't get bitten by poison ivy. It was getting dark and we had everything ready. The fire crackled in the bonfire. Suddenly I felt like peeing, so I told my mother I was going to the grove. But don't go too far, dinner's almost ready, my mother told me, and I nodded from afar. I went into the lush forest and did my things. Once I was done, I pulled up my pants and started back, but just as I was about to leave, I saw something out of the corner of my eye. I turned my head, and in a pond a few meters away there was a girl. I was curious, so I decided to approach. She had long, messy black hair and two pigtails. She didn't look much older than me, maybe 13 or 14. She was wearing a torn pleated dress but no shoes. Her legs were covered in scratches. Hey, I greeted her as I approached her. Little by little, she turned to me. She had black bangs that covered half her face. My name is Reuben, I smiled at her. What's yours? A fog surrounded her. While she was silent, I could barely see the surrounding trees. I heard her whisper, Lulu. Lulu? It's weird, but it's a cute name. Where do you live, Lulu? I looked around me. It was hard to see anything. Besides, it was almost night. I can take you, if you want, she murmured while taking my hand. Her skin was smooth, even with the scratches, but she was very cold. I was paralyzed for a few seconds. I didn't know if I should go with her or not. I looked at her again. I got carried away and followed her. We went down a dirt path that was cluttered with dry leaves and fallen branches. At that moment, I only noticed her and not the fact that we were walking blindly in the fog. We arrived at an old abandoned two-story house, where the fog was even thicker. We sat on the porch watching the darkness. Aren't you afraid? You know, of living here by yourself in the woods? She hugged her bruised knees and kept her eyes hidden. Not really, 
Even with tall men, assassins, and four-legged monsters, I'm never scared. No one visits me anyway, she explained softly. I was surprised by her answer. For a moment, I thought she was crazy, but it seemed like she had been living there for quite some time. But where are you from? From a faraway dark place. I don't really like the dark. Bad things happen there. She shivered for a moment and then fell silent. Why are you covering your face? I asked after feeling a chill. I want to see you. I don't like people seeing my face. Another eerie silence filled the air. Then I cleared my throat. When do you think the fog will clear up? I'll have to get back to camp before my parents get worried. I looked at her and she stood up. Suddenly I felt something strange in her. A sad and demonic feeling overwhelmed me. Are you hungry? She asked, walking towards the door. Yes. I stood up, ready to follow her into the house. Inside, everything was very well cared for. The windows were clean, and the couch seemed comfortable. There were lights on in the kitchen area. I sat on the sofa. She came into the room with a bowl of soup and a shiny silver spoon. She put it on my lap and went to get me a napkin. Then she disappeared up some stairs. I sat alone to eat my soup. It was sweet and warm and suited me. I ate, thinking about my parents. I'd been away for a long time, but we hadn't gotten too far from the camp. I should hear my parents screaming my name. I should be able to hear from here, although everything became weird since the mist appeared. I was full after eating the soup and immediately fell asleep. I put the plate and spoon on the table and lay down on the sofa. I could only think about the girl. Where had she been? I fell asleep. I woke up in the dead of night with a loud scream coming from the basement. I got up from the sofa and looked around me. Only the creaking of the wooden boards could be heard. I looked at the table, but the plates were gone. I guess Lulu took them. I closed my eyes again. I was very sleepy. I was almost asleep when suddenly I was startled again by a scream. This time I was sure it wasn't my imagination. What if Lulu was in danger? I needed to make sure she was okay. I couldn't bear that something bad had happened to her. So I started looking around the house for the basement. When I grabbed the doorknob, an eerie coldness slowly ran through my body. I didn't want to open, but I steeled myself. Behind the door it was dark. I had to go down a staircase. I covered my nose. A fetid smell invaded me. As I went down, the bad smell was getting stronger. My stomach began to churn and my eyes watered. It smelled rotten. I found a switch and flipped it. The basement was now fully lit. In the corner of the room was another door covered in mold. Lulu! I yelled around me. There was no answer. Where could she be? Lulu! I screamed louder, more eagerly than before. I grabbed the doorknob on the corner door and pulled it open. Lulu? What I had seen in that room made me throw up. There was a whole room of bodies, rotting, decomposing bodies. There were men and women lying on the ground. They all had in common that none of them had eyes. There were only empty sockets looking through me. I couldn't stand it. I turned around and there was Lulu, her legs and arms covered in blood. I was horrified. I wanted all this to be a nightmare, that nothing was real. You've seen too much. She looked at me, her hair tossing to reveal her face. She had no eyes. Your face! I quickly backed away and tripped over some tools that were lying on the ground. She touched my face gently with her hand. You can't see my eyes right now, she said with a small smile. But I have them. I froze. My heart was beating intensely. I could hardly breathe. Lulu brushed all her hair away from her face, staining it with the blood from her hands. You see? The skin around the sockets began to tear and bleed. She seemed so sad, so hurt. Now that you've seen it, she reached her hand out to me and I smacked her. Get away from me! Don't touch me! I pushed her away and clumsily ran down the dark stairs. She followed me. You've seen too much! She repeated as she followed me. Give me your eyes! I looked back. She was standing on the porch. I kept running until I tripped over a branch and fell down a small hill. I hit my arm against a rock and screamed in pain. She appeared in front of me, put her hands a few inches from my face. I kicked her and ran away. She kept yelling for me to give her my eyes and she ran after me. Blood gushing from the small opening in my arm. That's when I realized that we were back at the pond where I'd first seen her. That meant my parents weren't too far away. I ran fast until I reached the camp. My family was shocked. I was dizzy and tired. I saw my mother. She looked so worried. The mist was gone. I was safe now. I fainted. I woke up in a hospital with my mother at my bedside. My arm was in a plaster cast. She leaned down to kiss me on the forehead. I'm so glad you're okay. You left for five minutes to go to the bathroom and came back with a broken arm and a bruise. Can you explain what you were doing? Five minutes? Just five minutes? 
I was only gone for five minutes, but the girl, the mist, the house, and the bodies. Had it been a dream? Honey, what are you talking about, son? There's no house in the area, and there was no fog on the mountain yesterday. I was sure I had seen the mist in the girl. She had touched my hand, fed me, and the bodies. What was happening to me? I was discharged from the hospital and we went home at last. At night, the fog lifted, but it didn't seem strange to me. It was normal in the area. I set the alarm clock, went to bed and closed my eyes. The house was in silence. The image of the girl was clear in my mind. I took a deep breath when I heard a creepy whisper. Give me your eyes. Bailey Evans was a 15-year-old girl who was responsible, studious, and pleasant with others. A girl full of dreams to fulfill. She was very pretty, with long wavy dark hair and porcelain white skin. What was most striking about her appearance were her eyes. She had heterochromia, and her eyes were each a different color. Her right eye was a very dark brown, almost black, and her left eye was a very light blue, almost like a diamond. Everyone who saw her for the first time was amazed. Like every day, Bailey woke up in high spirits. She put on her school uniform, had breakfast, and headed towards the institute. Her friends were at the door waiting for her. Bailey was always attentive in class. She liked to help her classmates and cheer people up when she saw them sad. She was lovely. It was recess time and Bailey rejoined her friends. The new boy caught her eye. He always sat alone on a bench. She thought that maybe he was shy and had a hard time making friends, so she decided to approach him. I'll come back soon. I'm going to talk to that boy, she said to her group of friends. The new one? Seems a bit strange. I wouldn't go near him, said one of her friends. I'm sure he's a good boy. Bailey walked over to the bench where the boy was sitting. Hello, Bailey said with a sweet voice. The boy, startled, looked at her. H hello he said shyly. Excuse me for greeting you so suddenly. I just wanted to introduce myself. My name is Bailey, and you are? My name is Da- uh, David. Delighted, David. Offered her hand to shake. Delighted too, Bailey. It must be difficult to start in a new institute without knowing anyone, but I'm sure you'll soon adapt and make a lot of friends. The bell rang and the students began to go to class. Well, recess is over. It's been a pleasure, David. We'll talk more another day. If you need help or anything, don't hesitate to let me know. I'm sure we'll be good friends. From that day on, Bailey always went to say hello to David at recess and to talk to him for a while. The boy wasn't very talkative. It was always Bailey who told him things and he stayed listening. After a long day of school, Bailey went to bed early. She was a deep sleeper and rarely woke up in the middle of the night. But that night, she woke up with the feeling that someone was watching her. She looked at the alarm clock and it was about 3.33 in the morning. She got up and went to her window to look but she didn't see anything strange. It must have been just a dream, she thought. She closed the curtains and returned to her bed falling soundly asleep. The next day, Bailey went to greet David at the usual bench, where he used to sit, but he wasn't there. It was very strange. What could have happened to him? After leaving class, Bailey received a call. It was David. Bailey, I don't feel very well. His voice sounded a bit tired. What's happening to you, she asked, worried. Nothing, I'm just a little sick. Could you come see me and bring me my homework? Of course. What time should I go? Could you come tonight? Mm, my parents don't let me go places at night, but I'll try it. Per perfect. At nine, she got ready to go to David's house, wearing her gray striped sweater with a blue skirt. She grabbed her backpack and headed out to David's house. When she arrived, she knocked on the door. David opened it. He looked tired and the dark circles under his eyes were very noticeable. Oh, you have a very bad face. Tis that, yes, I'm quite sick. He smiled weakly and invited her in. Aren't your parents here, she said as she looked around. No, they're still at work. They both sat in the kitchen. David offered her juice. They began to chat, and as always, Bailey did the most talking and he kept looking her in the eye. Sometimes she wondered if he was really listening to her or just minding his own business. Bailey looked at the time. It was already 11. Oh, how late it is. My parents are going to be angry with me. I have to go. She got up quickly, but David grabbed her arm, stopping her. No, I don't want you to go. But David, I can't stay. It's too late. I said stay, he said yelling. I I it's okay, she said with a trembling voice, sitting slowly back in the chair. What's wrong? Don't you tell me anything anymore? He said, looking straight into her eyes. I don't know what to tell you. I want to go home. Well, you know I don't usually talk much, but I want to tell you something. Since that day you came to greet me and I saw your face, 
with that smile, with those eyes, especially your left eye, the light blue one. It's my favorite. I can't stop thinking about it. I always want to look at it. Yesterday I went to your house to look at you, but you woke up and closed the damn curtain and I couldn't see you anymore, and I needed to see that eye. Bailey didn't know what to say. She was so scared she started to cry. Suddenly she began to fall asleep little by little. David had put sleeping pills in her juice. After a while, she began to open her eyes slowly. Her vision was blurry and she felt the pressure of some ropes that kept her tied to a chair and the insulating tape on her mouth that prevented her from speaking. It took a while to see clearly. Now they were in David's room who was on the bed. He had a shiny knife in his hands. You woke up early. As I was telling you before, I need that eye. I want to have it. David caressed Bailey's cheek as tears fell. Oh, come on. Don't cry. Weren't we friends? You have to share. Bailey began to cry desperately. I see you don't like the idea, he said with a horrible psycho smile as he stabbed the left eye of the young woman that he liked so much. Bailey writhed in pain and blood gushing out. David cupped the eye lovingly, untied the girl, and left her lying bleeding against the wall. He had what he wanted. I'm going to sleep, Bailey. Good night. Thanks for your gift. He turned off the light and went to sleep, without any remorse for what he had done to an innocent young woman. David woke up around half past three in the morning. He thought he heard a whisper. He looked around. There was nothing. It would be his imagination. He tried to sleep again. He heard the whisper again, looked again, and saw a bright blue light in the darkness where Bailey was. He turned on the light and could see the young woman. The dark, empty socket where the beautiful blue eye used to be glowed. Bailey began to smile slowly in a grotesque way. Each time her smile got bigger and bigger, showing some misshapen, sharp fangs. David stared at her in total horror, and she with her grotesque smile, with a cold and terrifying voice that chilled the blood, said, I see you. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like it. And if you want to see more Draw My Life videos, subscribe to our channel. See you on the next episode!